So my wife and I have four kids and we decided a few months ago we were going to drive here from Abilene with our four kids and with our parents, um, which sounded like a great idea at the time. Um, but it's pretty difficult, right? Some of you are on vacation. This is my vacation. Like right now, while I'm preaching, I'm, this is the vacation I have during this thing. But we drive for like 20 hours before we get to the California state line. And as we're coming up to the California state line, right before we get to like the inspection agent, two seconds before, the window's already rolled down, my wife leans over to me and says, don't tell him about the apples. <laughs> and... Two seconds later, the guy goes, you got any fruit in your car? Now, I was homeschooled and super sheltered and a really bad liar. So I immediately, <laughs> you know, what would make you ask something like that, you know? And started sweating like I'm smuggling heroin into California. Anyway, I did what you would do. Don't judge me. I said, no, I don't have any apples. I don't know what you're talking about. Can we move on? And drove on. And immediately as I'm driving, I start feeling really guilty. I start thinking, I'm coming to Pepperdine to talk about a book that says, let your yes be yes and your no, no. <laughs> so in my mind, I'm negotiating with God. I have that Genesis 3 moment where I'm like, the woman that you gave me, God. <laughs> <laughs> then I just drove down the rest of the interstate with, you know, being a liar, liar, illegal fruit on fire. <laughs> And I tell you that because I know that lying is wrong, but it turns out I don't believe it. And I say that because James would say that, because faith isn't what you think. Faith is what you do. And I'm so glad that we've gone through this great, great lectureship. I'm grateful for Mike and Rick and the Pepperdine Bible lectureships for putting this on and for studying the book of James, because James is this this hidden gem in the Bible that I don't think we pay enough attention to. I mean, for one thing, it's this beautiful book, but also the very fact that you have it is great evidence that Jesus was raised from the dead because James is Jesus's brother and I have a brother. What would your brother have to do to make you think that he was the son of God, <laughs> right? I mean, seriously, this is really good apologetics. What in the world would your sibling have to do before you're like, yeah, he's divine? <laughs> and, and it's not just a great book because Jesus was the brother of James. It's also a great book because James was the brother of Jesus, which means that when Jesus tells stories like the prodigal son, it's important to remember, he has a brother when he's telling that story. And it's a brother who actually doesn't believe in him at the time. And James, the letter of James in your Bible is the answer to the question that you've asked before. Does the other brother come home? Does the other brother come home? I get homesick a lot. I'm from Arkansas and now I live in Abilene. These days when I get homesick, I tend to just go, you know, chill in Walmart for a little bit and that helps it go away. <laughs> but home is so much more than just a geographical location. It's that ache in your soul for the world to be set right. And James has finally come home because of the resurrection. And so he is riding out of a place of resurrection to communities of resurrected people. And I'm convinced today that we need James more than ever. Because these days we believe in Jesus. But we don't believe like Jesus. We tend to use words like grace to cover over things that really don't need to be covered over. We forget in the language of faith and theology that life is cumulative and that what you do today will impact tomorrow. And we know this in other areas of life. Nobody looks at that extra slice of pizza or that extra piece of cheesecake and says, you know what, I'm gonna have that anyway because gr grace covers it. No, like we know that's a categorical error, right? And James would say the same things to us. That it's possible for us to neglect our life with God and with each other, but eventually it's gonna start showing. Eventually we might find ourselves easily irritated. We might find ourselves becoming less and less generous. And we might actually find ourselves using words like grace to avoid becoming the very people God is calling us to be. See, here's the thing I think James wants everybody to know. 
there is a relationship between what you are practicing and the kind of person you are becoming. And I would imagine that if I asked everybody here tonight, if I asked you what the most important thing in your life was, everybody in this room would probably say God. Everybody in this room would say your faith. But if we sat down and looked at your calendar, it might say something else. Like some of us are practicing to become the masters of Netflix, right? <laughs> some of us, are, we, we spend our days consuming story, the same old tired storyline. We listen to the same kinds of songs that basically reproduce other people to their you know, certain body parts. And then we're shocked when we have that affair. Or we're surprised when we are in that relationship we shouldn't be in. Or when we blow up with anger. Some of us have stolen from like people we care about or from work. And we look back and we ask ourselves, how did we become this kind of person? And the answer is really simple. Somewhere along the way, you started practicing. You started practicing to become a certain kind of person. Faith isn't what you think. Faith is action. Have, have you ever noticed that whenever you buy a diet book or how many of you have ever bought like a treadmill or an elliptical? Show of hands. Or, or got a gym membership. Have you ever noticed that when you first do that, when you're first touring the gym, when you're first signing the paperwork, when they're first unloading the treadmill, have you ever noticed what you feel? Healthier. <laughs> but you're not. I mean, we know this, right? You're not healthier just because you got the new workout clothes. You're not healthier just because you got the new treadmill. Some of us have treadmills that have clothes hanging on them in our house <laughs> right now. And we never got healthier. And the reason I'm saying this is because this is something we all know. If you use it, that's when it makes a difference. Our problem, I think, general, in general, Western Christianity's problem is that we are educated far beyond our level of application. Did you know that last year, and this was hard to find the, the number, exact numbers for, but it's something like this. Last year, in America, a half a million Bibles were bought a week. A week. And this, this is 2014, right? You guys remember the headlines from 2014. Remember all the racism? Remember all the violence? Remember all the greed? Remember all the destruction? And, and if, you, if you think about that for a second, it leads to this really startling and disturbing conclusion. conclusion. The Bible doesn't change you. But the application of the Bible in community and led by the Holy Spirit, that actually changes people. And the reason I'm saying this so forcefully is because there's this idea that starts to sink into our minds, I think. That if we're just in church, if we just think the right things, that God will give us a good marriage, God will give us a good career, that God looks down on us in the, being in the right building in the right hour of the right day and thinks, you know what, I'm gonna give her a good parking spot at Target. Like that's how it works. But it's actually more disturbing than that, I've found. I've been in ministry for about 13 years and it took me a decade to figure this out. There are some Sundays when I've got to say some difficult things to the church, right? And I know this is coming and I try to gird my loins and prepare myself for it. And it took me a decade to realize that when I have those kinds of sermons, I'm expecting the pushback. I'm expecting people to disagree or, or to say, well, what about, what about the, the most surprising thing happens. I hear, thank you. And here's what it took me a decade to figure out. You know what happens when you feel guilty in church? You think it's a religious experience. <laughs> and some of us, the guiltier we feel, the closer to God we felt. I mean, this is a really strange thing. Or here's another thing that I've learned. I was kind of taught that what it meant to preach was that you take a passage that you know, people have probably heard a lot of times before and you try to bring out something new that they've never thought of before. You try to bring out a new angle they'd never seen it from before. And when you do it successfully, you'll know it because you'll hear this. Mmm. On, on my better days, you know, we sound like a bunch of cattle, just, <laughs> you know. And after we're done humming, or after we're done feeling guilty, we go back to life as usual. 
And this sneaky idea starts to come in. That if we go to a building, if we listen, if we feel guilty about ourselves, if we learn something new, then we're actually becoming better people. But that's not true, is it? And you know who knows this? The people who don't go to our church. You want to know who knows this? Your waitress, your waiter. The people who look around and they see our coffee mugs and our bumper stickers and our Christian t-shirts, and they look at the fruit of our lives and they think, it's not working for them. Because what they believe isn't really how they live. Because faith isn't what you think. It's action. And there are two people that emphasize this in the Bible. There's Jesus and there's James. James. Turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1. This is where we're going to start. And hear what James says to people very much like us. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Did you catch that? Don't lie to yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at it goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. People who listen and don't do are like people who look in a mirror and do nothing with what they just saw. I bet everybody in this room today looked at a mirror before you came here. And I heard one preacher say it this way, you know how long you looked? As long as it took, right? You know, some of us got up, we looked at the mirror and we thought, that's not going to work. We're going to have to do something about that. And some of us spent a lot of time looking in the mirror. But here's something we all kind of intuitively know. Looking in a mirror doesn't make you better looking, right? I mean, we all do something with what we've just the information that we've just been given, right? Except for 12-year-old boys, and then at least they have the wisdom to spray copious amounts of Axe body spray on themselves, right? (laughs) But every one of us, what we do something with what we learn. And the real problem isn't that we don't know enough. I honestly think the real problem is that we've had such a tiny view of salvation. For a lot of us, we've thought that salvation means God was angry, We did these certain things and now God's not angry anymore and all is well. And that sounds fine until your spouse files the papers or until blue lights are in the mirror or until the doctor says it's not good news. That thin view of grace sounds really fine until life hits the fan and suddenly we start wishing we were equipped to respond in certain Jesus-like ways. The Barna Group is a group that surveys uh, people in the West um, in Christianity. And over and over again, they come out with surveys when they ask people like, what has following Jesus changed for in your life? And the answers come back pretty consistently, not much. I like the way Dallas Willard talks about this. Dallas Willard says, non-discipleship, if you can put that up, non-discipleship is the elephant in the church. It's not the much discussed moral failures, financial abuses, or the amazing general similarities between Christians and non-Christians. These are only effects of the underlying problem. It is now understood to be a part of the good news that one does not have to be a life student of Jesus in order to become a Christian and receive forgiveness of sins. This gives a precise meaning to cheap grace, though it would be better described as costly faithlessness. How do we get here? How do we get here from this idea of following the most revolutionary man who ever lived to it really not making much of a difference for us? I think a lot of us, we reacted, at least um, this is my story, I reacted to this view of legalism, you know, where, where, you know, following Jesus involved, you know, certain rules and a certain way of life. And we realized, you know, we were free in Christ, And we reacted against that. We realized God didn't judge people based on whether or not they made these petty mistakes. And that's a needed shift. But something started to creep in, didn't it? We started to believe that since God forgave sins, our character no longer mattered. Look, I I no longer believe that drinking beer is a sin. I think drinking light beer might be a sin, but not drinking beer. (laughs) You're free. If you're 21 years of age, you're free to drink. But if you use that freedom too much, too often, and for the wrong reasons, you may find yourself in a day where you are no longer not free to drink. 
I, when I was 18 years old, the good people of Delaware sent me a little plastic card and they told me I could use it for whatever I wanted. And I did. Anytime I wanted anything, I bought clothes, I bought my friends clothes. I spent more money than I'd ever seen in my life. I just, whenever something I saw I wanted, I shook the money tree. Then all of a sudden they wanted that money back. <laughs> and I was free to spend until I found myself unable to be free to spend on anything but paying them back. And here's what James is saying. He's not saying this because he's a legalist. Remember, he's the younger brother come back. He's not trying to slave for Jesus. He's trying to be a servant for Jesus. He knows this is the best possible way to live. That's why he says this is the life that gives freedom. And this, this is what I wish we knew. This works both ways. Our bad habits lead to death and destruction, but our good habits can lead to life. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a great book called Outliers where he basically said the really great people, the people who are the masters of certain arts are people who have spent 10,000 hours practicing. They're the people who have been able to master their discipline. And that sounds like common sense, but it's not very common. Because a lot of us know a lot of information about Jesus. But you know what they call people who know a lot of information about people without a relationship with them? Stalkers. <laughs> Have any of you ever been stalked? You probably wouldn't know it if it was a good stalker, but this, that's what it is. And so many of us, we grew up, you know, we'd hear these Bible stories and then our teacher, or, or maybe we would, we would say, you know, Jesus raised these people from the dead. Uh, you know what the Greek or Hebrew word for the dead is? And we'd go down that trail for a little bit. And some of you maybe have left church because you kind of intuitively knew you wanted to do something with your life before you were the Greek or Hebrew word of dead. And I, by the way, I'm very grateful for our tribe and the way that we really care about loving God with our mind. But anytime I'm tempted to think that that's primarily what this is about, I look at my bookshelf. I borrowed these from the Pepperdine Library because I didn't want to drive with them. But on my bookshelf are these books, the TDNT, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. It is by far the most sophisticated Greek lexicon and study, in-depth study of the New Testament and its Greek language. And I look at this when I'm tempted to think it's all about thought because this was produced by an enthusiastic Nazi. He died before he was able to be brought to uh, trial for his crime. He was an enthusiastic Nazi. And anytime I'm tempted to think that faith is what I think, I look over there and I'm reminded that faith is actually a verb. And Jesus loves Verbs, And that brings us to our main part of James. In chapter 2, verse 14, here's what Jesus, or James says. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace and keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that. And shudder, you foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? James is quoting the Shema. It's the passage that every little Jewish boy and girl would have grown up memorizing. Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. And he's basically saying, you believe it? You got the theology right? Good for you. You know who else knows that? The demons. Because faith isn't what you think. Faith is action. In Hebrews 11, the most famous faith chapter of the Bible, did you ever notice that by faith is always followed by a verb? So it tells us a hero of the faith, an exemplar of the faith, like Abraham or Rahab, Abraham by faith. And then it tells us what they did. Our job is to find the verb because Jesus loves verbs. The word Christian is a noun and follow is the verb. Somewhere along the way, we tried to make Christian into an adjective, didn't we? with you know, putting the right bumper stickers on, Christian you know, music or, or colleges or whatever it is. And we lost our verb. And you know what the world calls people who lose their verbs? Hypocrites. 
Because it's you know, lovers who don't love, givers who don't give, followers who don't follow. And before you disagree with this, I want you to think about this. This is how God introduces himself. When he's talking to Moses, God says, I was, I am, and I always will be. If you wanna know who I am, look at my action in human history. If you wanna know who God is, Jesus is love in the flesh. And as far as I know, he never once asked people to agree with him. He asked us to follow him, which means for some of us, for some of us, it's time to stop having Bible studies. It's time to start having Bible doings, right? Yeah. For some of us, it's time to start asking, how can we have habits that form us that are formed by faith? Because that's when faith makes a difference, when faith becomes action. Remember when I was a freshman at Harding, uh, my freshman Bible teacher was Rich Little. And he took me on a spring break campaign to Jamaica to work with this great little church there. First time I'd ever really been out of the state of Arkansas. I go to Jamaica with a, a group of people and we're door knocking. Remember that? We used to do that. We're door knocking in Jamaica and we get to a dump. And we find out that people are there, that live there. And we, you know, we're supposed to ask them to have a Bible study and, and somewhere along the way that just felt a little bit like we should do more. So we went back to talk to this church that was a good little church and we said, hey, there's people living in the dump. Can we do something about that? And they said, no, we're just gonna study the Bible. And I remember thinking then, if that's all this is, then that's not reading the Bible correctly. There's something wrong. If that's what our answer to this problem is, we're not reading the Bible correctly. When I worked at the Hills Church in Fort Worth, the tsunami hit Southeast Asia. And there was a group of people that went over there many times pouring out their lives for the, the least of these, the people who had basically lost everything. And at one point I got to go over there with one of those groups and I wasn't a very good worker, but they worked us hard. All day long for weeks we would work trying to help do whatever we could to help repair and restore this little bitty village. And at one point at the end of one of those really hard days, I remember getting in the car and we smelled awful. And I remember thinking to God, I bet we smell great. I think Jim still needs to put on deodorant, but I think God thinks we smell <laughs> great. Every spouse knows this, that love is sometimes measured by calories burned. That the best way to tell I love you sometimes is by taking out the trash. Think about it. When we finally see Jesus, he's not gonna say, well said, good and faithful servant. He's gonna say, well done. Which is why Jesus ends his most famous sermon, the one that James sounds the most like, the way he does. Remember how he ends it in Matthew chapter seven? He's saying all these amazing things and then he says, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds their house on sand. Those who don't put them into practice is like a, a, a wise man who... who Hold on, you, you got the point, I think. <laughs> Just switch that, right? Do you ever wonder why Jesus starts sounding like Bob Vila at the end of his sermon? Like, what is he trying to do here? Do you remember who he was talking to? In Matthew 5, 1, the Sermon on the Mount, the context of it is when he saw the crowds, he sat down and the disciples came to him. He's talking to the wise and the foolish. When he saw the crowds and disciples. These days there are plenty of crowds. Look, you wanna start a mega church? In Texas, you just lay down a Bible and one will pop up if you do it. <laughs> There's always Jesus crowds. What Jesus is on the lookout for are people who will do it. We call those disciples. So when I was at Harding, um, I went to Greece for a semester, my wife and I, and one of our friends also went to Greece, a guy named Lloyd, and Lloyd wanted to run the marathon. He wanted to run it really badly, but I don't know how the delicate way to say this is, Lloyd didn't have the body type to run a marathon, but he signed up for it when he got there. He wanted to run it where the original marathon was run, and every day as it was inching closer to the day of the marathon, we kept thinking, Lloyd, are you gonna, you know, practice? <laughs> He'd always be like, tomorrow, tomorrow. And um, it, eventually he never did, Day of the marathon came, Lloyd goes to it, lines up on the starting line, and we're all wondering, is Lloyd gonna make it? Starts, a few hours later, Lloyd 
finished. You know, this guy does not have the body type for it. He's out of shape. So we're all like, Lloyd, what's your secret? He was like, I took a taxi. (laughs) I would imagine that most of us in this room could not run a marathon right now. More to the point, most of us in this room couldn't run a marathon even if we tried really, really hard. Sometimes we think that the hard way to learn piano is by sitting down and practicing the scales every day, but that's not the hard way to learn a piano. The hard way to learn piano is by going in front of a packed studio hall that thinks you know how to play piano and sitting down without ever having practiced. That's the hard way to learn piano. And it's, it's easy, I understand. It's easy to get discouraged with the way of Jesus because the way of Jesus can be difficult. It's easy to ask questions like, why is it so difficult? And James would say, because it's worth something. Because it's beautiful. Because if you follow Jesus, life actually gets better and easier. And here's the point of the gospel, the point of James. The world is one day going to be like this. Jesus isn't trying to take things away from us. He's showing us where the world is going, where all of creation is going. And those of us who know how to follow Jesus well now will be fluent in the language of God. I like the way Dallas Willard says this again. He says, I am thoroughly convinced that God will let everyone into heaven who can stand it. But standing it may be a bit more difficult for those who take their view of heaven from popular movies may think. I often wonder how happy and useful some of the fearful, bitter, lust-ridden, hate-filled Christians I've seen involved in church or family or political battles would be if they were forced to live forever in the unrestrained fullness of God. The fires in heaven may be hotter than those in the other place. Here's the thing. If you're a racist, God's going to let you into heaven. You just won't like it. Because you'll be around people from every tribe and every tongue. God is genuinely going to let everybody into heaven who can stand it. This is the way the world is going to one day be. And James, Jesus are saying, so start practicing that now. Because faith isn't what you think. Faith is action. And eventually, what you really believe, you'll be able to see by how you really live. Eventually, what you practiced your whole life, it will always come out. And that can be a very, very good thing. It was a couple of weeks after he had been diagnosed with Ebola when I learned that Kent Brantley went to Highland, the church that I work at, when he was in college. He sat under the preaching of Mike Cope. And while he was, right after he had been diagnosed with Ebola, Randy Harris was preaching at his church that day. And he talked to Kent hours after he found out he had Ebola. And he asked Kent, what should I tell the church? And Kent said, I want you to ask them to pray for Nancy. Who says that? And then when the medicine came in for these two doctors who had Ebola, like a movie script, there was only one dose. And Kent, this father, this guy who's my age, he, with, he tells them, give the medicine to Nancy. And I don't know about you, but when I heard that story, it both broke and made my heart swell with the best kinds of pride. And immediately I thought, I know exactly how long it took him to make that decision. Decades. The day he got Ebola, before he knew he had Ebola, he was feeling under the weather and he reached for his devotion book unaware that the world would soon be watching to see what this young disciple would do. His name was Dorwin Stodder. In 2011, he's a 76-year-old construction worker. In 2011, Dorwin and his wife went to a a, um, supermarket to see the senator, Gabrielle Gifford. When a mentally ill man came charging towards them to assassinate Gabrielle Gifford, Dorwin saw that the gun was pointed at his wife and he leapt in front of the bullets being struck and killed. And the preacher at the funeral said, in order for you to understand Dorwin's death, you had to understand he died the way he lived. Every day he laid down his life for his wife and on this day, 
he didn't pick it back up. Her name's Joyce Dalzell, and she started FaithWorks in Abilene. It's this ministry that's blessed hundreds, maybe thousands of unemployed and underemployed people in Abilene. She started this ministry that has gotten these people who didn't have jobs, jobs, real, tangible, money-earning jobs. And she does it with compassion and grace. And she does it because when she was 12 years old, her parents took in a single mom of six because that's what Christians do because faith isn't what you think. Faith is what you do. And when she saw that, something resonated in her that has been echoing ever since. You know when Jesus ends his sermon on the mount, when he says everybody who puts their faith into practice, it'll be like a person building their house on a rock. You know that's temple language? You know, just a few hundred uh, feet away, there's a temple and everybody in that day would have gotten it. And Jesus is saying, if you do this, if you live this way, you will be walking, breathing temples. This is God's dream for his people, that we will practice the future in the present, that we will be people that show the world what God's dream for the world is and always has been, that we will realize that our faith is not just something that we think, but an embodied way of life. And the young doctor reached for his devotional book, unaware that the world was about to be watching him. And the 76-year-old construction worker jumped in front of the bullets and the preacher said he died the way he lived. And the family said to the single mom of six, come stay at our house. And people have been getting jobs ever since. This is the way of Jesus, and it's beautiful. So believe in God and break a sweat. Let's stand and worship.